Great. So, uh, and a late good afternoon to all those attending for another uh, virtual Toronto Tableau user group session. I'm Roland Schlichting. I'm one of your Toronto Tableau community leaders. And I'm joining you today from my home office in Ajax, which is just outside of Toronto. Uh, I'm certainly looking forward to spending some time with you all. Uh, also joining me on the line is Candice Monroe. She's a, also one of our uh, Toronto community leaders, and she'll be moderating the questions, keeping us on schedule, and also making sure I don't forget anything along the way. Candace joins us all the way from the East Coast of Canada in Nova Scotia, Halifax. Hello, Candace. Um, Hello. We have an excellent agenda today, and I'm uh, really excited to have uh, two guest speakers. Uh, we have Jared Flores, who's going to talk uh, Tableau Prep, and we have Kirk Monroe, a frequent contributor to our community, and he'll be talking about creating data models within, within Tableau uh, relationships and doing it properly. Uh, we'll also have a Kahoot that uh, either Kirk or Candace will run, and I'm sure there's uh, gonna be some kind of prize for a winner, at least I hope so. Uh, so let's get to it, shall we? So uh, Tableau Prep for me is something I really got interested in when I first saw it demoed. Now I think I saw it demoed at TC17, However, I do know that it was released in 2018.1, so perhaps my dates may be crossed. Anyways, what I wanted to say is I, once I saw a tool, I really saw its value and I liked it. Uh, I know it's had several updates and releases since then, but for me, I just like the flexibility it has by leveraging different types of data, using data cleansing, and most important to me, it was an easy tool to pick up quite quickly and it's so closely integrated with Tableau Desktop, where I reside most of the day. So there's entire entire Tableau communities that are dedicated to Tableau Prep. So I really thought the timing was right for us to showcase here in the Toronto Tug uh, this Tableau Prep. So our first guest today, all the way from Dallas, is uh, Jared Flores. Jared uh, joins us from Analytics Vision, uh, which is a and he is a solutions leader. Is quite the resume, as you can see in the, on the screen there, and quite a list of accomplishments, many associated with Tableau Prep. For example, 2022 Busy Award as a prep star. And you know that's voted on by his peers. Um, congratulations for that, Jared. Um, he recently also completed 100 days of prepping data. He hosts an amazing YouTube channel, Put Some Prep in Your Step, uh, which I encourage everyone to visit. And finally, he does some teaching uh, as a Tableau instructor as well. Um, and he's been doing that in partnership with uh, Emory University. So Jared, welcome to Toronto Tug. We're happy to have you join us today from Dallas and uh, why don't you take it away? Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, definitely really happy to be here. Really just happy to talk about Tableau Prep. Um, so really today, I just kind of want to talk about, you know, a quick, Sort of intro as far as what is Tableau Prep, um, just kind of high overview, what are the benefits of it, um, and then show a couple of examples of here are ways that I use put prep into practice um, to do some really cool things, uh, and then cap it off with um, you know some of my favorite things to do inside the tool. So uh, again, you know, I think you pretty much touched everything uh, in the introduction. So yeah, really happy to to be here. Um, what is Tableau Prep Builder? Uh, Tableau Prep Builder is the application interface that you use uh, to prepare data from Tableau. So their goal in making Tableau Prep was similar to their goal in making Tableau Desktop. Desktop was meant to put data visualization into the hands of everyone. And so Tableau Prep Builder is meant to put data preparation into the hands of everyone and try to simplify what that looks like and make it easier to jump into. Second, gotta make sure I stay on time. Okay. Um, so see, these are some of the benefits, right? At, at a high level of stepping into Tableau Prep. So it is the data preparation, data cleansing interface. So you can clean and combine data, um, connect to multiple different data sources. So if you have local files, uh, databases, uh, you can connect to those. You can even use ODBC or JDBC connections. Um, and you can use the tool to automate your, your processes uh, depending on 
if you're using, for example, Tableau Online or Tableau Server, the data management add-on, that would allow you to use Prep Conductor, schedule flows, link them together, uh, and really expand what you can do uh, as far as making Tableau more self-service for your ecosystem. The really the most powerful things about it in my mind are how easy it makes validation and exploring your data and just some of the cleansing operations or some of the really common things that you would need to do to a data set are baked in to some of the one click uh, operations that you can do so let's take a look at just you know now stepping into it what are like, what does it look like when you're really using it uh, to flesh out your data? So what this is, this is a flow that I've got connected to uh, Python. So another great thing about Tableau Prep, you can pull Python uh, scripts directly into it. So what I did here with this flow is I have some Python scripts that connect directly to the YouTube APIs. Uh, so I wanted to analyze my channel data. There are some built-in analytics if you are a YouTube creator, but I wanted to see how what does that look like on the back end? How can I customize that? How can I create a dashboard with that and make that uh, public facing? So I've got a couple of different Python scripts over here. Uh, so this one, you can see it's my channel data. This one here goes into each video. And then this one down here, grabs the uh, titles for each video because the YouTube API has all of these things segmented out separately. So I have Python scripts that grab those, prep brings those in, and then I combine and shape some of those things to create uh, this dashboard here. So this is my uh, YouTube dashboard where I can look at you know, my views and, and things like this, how they're trending over time. But what I really wanted to do here was uh, this sort of ranking of my videos over here. And I wanted to make this dynamic. So this this is just using the template from the Lurlidge twins. They have a bunch of templates, this templates. And so this is using their template on the Kirby bump chart. And usually they've got, uh, they, they have some Excel sheets uh, and they kind of walk you through on their website, how to plug your data into the Excel sheets. And then it does a little bit of work uh, and how you join it in Tableau Desktop to make the data, uh, shape the data in a way that the calculations applied to it give you this sort of curved uh, ranking, curved bump chart. And so I have this prep flow uh, here, this part of my prep flow over here. What this does is it takes each of my metrics and breaks it down in a way where I can actually do all of that data transformation and shape it. That way I don't have to use a tablet workbook to do anything. And that way I can just and take my data set, plug it straight into the template and it gives me that uh, bump chart. But again, like I said, I wanted to make it dynamic. So if I come in here, if I come in here and change this metric. So right now it's set on my views for my channel. If I change it to minutes watched, then that bump chart now is ranking my minutes watched. Or if I change it to view duration, now it's ranking the view duration. And so if I wanted to do this the, the standard way, the way it's outlined in the blog, I'd have to make sure that I prepare my data separately for each of those metrics, and then make sure when I do the join in the workbook that all of that is considered. But now, since I have the prep flow doing all of that work for me, it's gonna pick up. If I ever decide to add new metrics, like maybe I wanna do uh, viewers by country, or um, you know, I wanna break down my metrics and add more in there, instead of me having to go in to my data set, readjust how everything is joining and densifying, this prep flow here is gonna pick up those metrics automatically. Because you see right here in this step, I'm ag aggregating all my metrics. And so as new metrics come in, it's going to come in here. This part of my prep flow is going to do all of that work for me. And that dashboard is going to continue to pick it up in a way that it will still be able to work dynamically. So that's you know one thing right there, right? Using it for uh, out-of-the-box chart types. 
and using it in a way that it's going to remain dynamic. I don't have to go in and adjust it each time I'm adding new data to my flow. Another way that I've used it, um, it kind of along the same lines. So in this case, uh, I was working with CJ. Can, can I ask you a quick uh, question, uh, Jared? Can I interrupt you and ask yeah. you a quick question? Because we have some questions already in the chat. <laughs> mm -hmm. People are very curious. Uh, so somebody asked, can you do the same with Rails? So I thought maybe that was probably, it, like it's probably in context here. So did you want, should we answer that yet? And somebody also asked where the templates are. Uh, so templates, I have a website, uh, put some prep in your step.com. There is a list of blog posts uh, with the templates. There's a Google Drive for each blog post that will give you the pre-built template. Uh, and I okay. and in the blog post, it tells you how to plug in your data into it. And then I also oh, have awesome. accompanying videos for each of those that tells you if you want to learn how to build it yourself, here's how to do it. Perfect. Um, awesome. Yeah. And then you said how to how to do the same thing for Rails. Sorry, I muted myself. Uh, yes. So Elad asked, can you do the same with Rails? Does that make sense? Or do you need me to clarify? I, yeah, I need a little bit of clarification there. Yeah. Uh, Ruby? Um, yeah, okay. I think he means Ruby okay. on Rails. I'm, anyway. Oh, OK. Ruby on Rails instead of Python, probably. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So you can use Python, and you can use, you can use R and Python. Those are the two supported scripts um right now uh, i'm not sure if they add are plan on adding more but so there is a tab pi server that you can connect to for tap for python and then there is an r serve python that you can connect on uh, to for r awesome yeah that was it he got it yep awesome Perfect. um okay so sort of along the same lines um, one thing I wanted to do, uh, was create something, uh, working with CJ Mays. So if you know, CJ Mays is Tableau visionary and a lot of his, he has a lot of templates and a lot of them are around sports brackets, tournament brackets and things like that. And uh, while I think I want to say sometime last year, he created a couple of tournament brackets using that same sort of curvy bump chart. And so I, what I wanted to do because the way he created it does take a lot of, you have to know, you know, what are the rules of this sport? How are these things bracketed out? How are the teams ranked? So that way they can get placed in that bracket properly. I wanted to see, can I create a prep flow that does all of that automatically? So uh, me, I'm a very big uh, hockey fan. Um, you know, disappointing loss last night to the, to the Leafs here in Dallas, but um I wanted to see, can I take the data that's out there, uh, clean it up, plug it in here, and account for all of the, the weird things. So if you're familiar with the NHL uh, playoff bracket, there's a lot of weird things that happen to do tiebreakers, like who, if two teams have the same record, who had the, big, the higher goal differential, or um, whenever teams move through rounds, are they reseeded? And it's changed a lot through the years. So you know, early on, there was uh, each round got reseeded. I, I want to say um, there, I can't remember if when I did this one, there was reseeding or not, but basically I was trying to account for all of these different things here in the prep flow. So here I've got um, a list of the NHL teams. So if I click in here, um, here you can see, I've just got a list of each of the NHL teams. Uh, I've got their conference, their division, um, and I included the city in there just, just to do it. Um, and then here, I've got the uh, regular season data that comes from, uh, it's a website called hockeyreference.com. And so that was just the website that I happened to find that had a, at least an exportable uh, data for me. And so what I did here was I took the regular season data and I, uh, this, this rank field here, was already embedded in the data. So that made it really easy. All the teams are already ranked. 
Uh, I don't have to do anything there as far as how did they come out in the regular season. And what I, but I, what I did have to do when you look at the playoffs, you know, you've got your divisionals, uh, each, the top three teams in each division are in the playoffs, but then the, after those, then the top two teams in the conference are your wild cards. But then when you actually look at your matchups, the first seed from the higher of the, uh, you know, whichever division had the top performing top seed, that first seed faces your first wild card. And then the top team from the second best performing uh, division, that top seed goes against your second wild card. So I had to figure out how do I account for that? How do I rank that in here? Um, and so that's kind of what I'm, I'm doing here. I'm trying to figure out here's each team's rank within the conference. Here's each team's rank within their division. So their division rank makes it easy for me to say, okay, this is that seed within that division. And I just used uh, the first letter of the division. So A1 is the Atlantic one. Uh, M1 is Metropolitan one. So I, there I've got my um, divisional seeds, but then I have to go in and say, okay, now that I've got those figured out, I need to remove those and figure out out of the teams that are left, what are my two wild cards from each conference? And so that left me with uh, Bruins, Capital, Stars, and Preds. And then from there, once I've got that figured out, now I bring everything back together and recalculate it to get a list of uh, here are all of my seeds, here are my wild cards, um, and then I can come to a place where I can get my matchups. And so. I'm reorganizing the data, shuffling it around. So that way I've got this very specific sorting where I've got the first seed at the Atlantic versus the second wild card and the first seed in the Metropolitan versus the first wild card. So I've got to go through, make sure I've got all of that adjusted. In the end result, there's a lot of stuff happening here. I've got to go through, re-rank eat through each round, make sure I've got my matchups right. And the end result, what you see happening here it's actually the same template that I used back in my YouTube flow over here. It's the same exact template. It's just that curvy bump uh, data preparation template. And so what I ended up with was this nifty little dashboard that shows me uh, each team where they were seated. And I can see the conference quarterfinals and then who advanced and kind of trace that through to see who ended up advancing and winning the playoffs. And again, the data preparation piece was really where most of the work happened because all I did was take that data set that it output and plug it into CJ's template. So again, making, uh, and you know, the logic for that was not uh, super straightforward, trying to account for all of the different rules, uh, all of the different re-rankings, splitting out the conferences, considering, um, you know, how am I actually calculating how they're moving through the playoff rounds? Um, but prep with prep, I was able to do all of that and get it into a place where now for uh, come playoff season this year, I'll be able to build out, out the bracket and actually trace uh, as the playoffs move along how teams are pro progressing until we get to the ultimate winner. Um, so again, really cool ways to use prep and implement it in a way that stays nice and dynamic. The uh, last sort of example on how I've used it, um, and this one is, there's a lot going on here as well, but this is what I used, the data that I prepared for my IronViz submission back in, uh, actually, was that this year? I think that was this year, actually. Yeah, it was early February. Um, or early January, whenever that was submitted. So this was my uh, submission for, but for last year's conference. And so what I did was I extracted the Spotify data for Dead Mouse uh, Electro uh, DJ. Um, and so I just uh, extracted what Spotify had as his discography, all of his albums and tracks, and cleaned it up because there's a lot of duplication. Spotify actually has a lot of like the same tracks and the same albums listed. Um, so I had to go in and clean up the data. And then once I had gotten it cleaned where I had unique tracks, uh, Spotify actually has metrics. So there's uh, danceability, 
instrumentalness, liveness, acousticness, uh, mood. You know, there's all of these different metrics that they measure on a scale from zero to one. Uh, and so in my mind, I had this idea of like, that's the sort of shape of each of the songs. And then that can turn into the shape of each of the albums. And so I did a couple of things here. Up here, what I did was I uh, took the data and split it out in a way where I could output what I put. This is a rain cloud plot, which essentially is a violin plot, but half of it. So I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Uh, but the basis of my viz, and here I'll, I'll show so you've got some context. The basis of my viz, what I wanted to be my centerpiece was this chart right here. It's just a play on a radar chart. So a radar chart, you've got attributes and uh, each of the points uh, kind of branching out from the center, measure your attribute on that scale. And so I wanted to do the same thing, but using these sort of pedal shapes. Um, and so in my prep flow, uh, that's what is happening here in this middle piece. So I've got pedals by album. Uh, that Those are being created by this part of my flow. I've got pedals by track being created by this part of the flow. And then down here, I've got um, what you see, it's called logo plot. And what that is, is here at the top of my viz. Let's scroll up. Uh, oops. There is the uh, dead mouse logo. But actually, each of these little points on the logo were uh, their tracks. And so if I click on one of these, I can, it will actually pull up the track in Spotify. And I encoded this and created the shape for it by using prep to map out uh, each of these little dots and then make sure that each of the dots had a unique track and that each of those tracks had the actual Spotify ID encoded into them. Um, and then as I talked about, so here is just sort of an average taking all of those metrics. This is the shape of Dead Mouse's music. This whole discography rolled up into one. This is the shape of it, which really centers around danceability, energy, and instrumentalness based on those being the highest of the metrics. And then down here, uh, what we've got is we've got that broken out by each of his albums. And they really do, like at a glance, they look all kind of the same. But that was really just to highlight the consistency in his career and how that has translated into success for him. Um, there is this one album that is very different shaped, and that's because it was a um, orchestral album. And then when I talked about that rain cloud plot, that's what this is down here. So you have a half violin that sort of shows you the density, the distribution of the data, and then the actual individual plots down here. So it looks like rain falling from a cloud. Um, but yeah, those are three ways that I have, you know, kind of seen what can I do with prep? How can I push it to its limits um, and do some really interesting things with it? And so before I'm actually doing really good on time, uh, before I hand it off, I do want to show one of my favorite things to do in prep, and that is uh, to create dynamic, uh, dynamic calendars. So you do any work with data preparation, data modeling, you'll probably run into at some point the need to create a sort of calendar table to kind of attach your data to make sure that every date has a value associated with it, or to just do some kind of scaffolding, building, using your calendar as a sort of base to attach and build your data to. And so in prep, we can, we can create that here in prep and do it in a way that it stays dynamic. So I'm just going to drag in this table here. This is using the sample superstore data set. And so what I want to do is I want to say, I've got to create a calendar table, but I want to make sure that that calendar table is still within the bounds of my data set. Let's say um, practice scenario, right? Uh, this is going to be my main table. Everything else it needs to kind of tie back to this table. And so the dates from this table are what I want to use as my primary dates. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, create two fields. I'm going to call this one uh, scaffold start. And I'm going to use, or actually, first I'm going to find the minimum and the maximum date. So I'll call this min date. And I'll say, I want to find the minimum order date in this data set. Ah, 
course I would pick that one. Hold on. Okay. So I want to find the minimum order date in my data set. And then I want to make sure that that is a date, not a date time. And then I want to find the maximum date in my data set. Now I've got two dates, my minimum date, and my maximum date, and they're both in a date format right here. So 1-6 of 2015 and December 30th of 2018. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is I'll create my scaffold start, which is my minimum date. And then I'll create my scaffold end, which is my maximum date. And then I'm gonna click those two fields and I'm gonna keep only those fields. So I only need those two right now. And you can see whenever you create a calculation in prep that it duplicates for every single row in the data set. So it happens for every row, but I only need one row with those two values. So I'm gonna use the aggregate step to say, I wanna group my data by these two fields. That's gonna return a unique grouping uh, of every combination of values between those. And there's only one unique grouping, so I get one row back, which is you see down here. And so now I'm gonna say, um, okay, so I wanna take the new row step. I wanna use values from two fields between my start date and my end date. And so now what I've got is, let's call this calendar date. What it's doing is it's creating a value for every one day in between my start and my end. And so we see that result uh, actually over here gives us the preview here in the middle. So we can see start, end, and here's all of the rows being generated in there. So now I've got a row, I've got one calendar table, I can go in and remove those. And so now I have a date between my start date and my end date. And so the reason why I love this is because as new dates come in to this table, this calendar table is going to grow with it. And so it's not necessarily dependent on today's date, it's dependent on dates within the data set. Um, so yeah, with that, um, like I said, that's just one of my favorite things to do uh, in prep. I use it a lot and you can use, do it with different things too, right? You can do it with numerical values. Um, you can say, how many values are in this table? I need to generate some kind of numbers dimension that ties into the number of rows in this table. Uh, do the math in prep, and then generate a uh, scaffold. Uh, one of the ways that I've used that is, for example, looping through um, if I'm parsing JSON out, right? Uh, and there's a bunch of different variables in that dependent on the number of rows in tied to a certain thing, then I can use that to dynamically create my numbers dimension and parse through that text. Um, but yeah, prep is awesome. I encourage you to look into it. I encourage you to get into it. Um, and really use it to explore your data and, uh, you know, tackle some of the out-of-the-box Tableau uh, visualizations that usually require some kind of Excel uh, workaround to get to. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, thanks. This is a great uh, look at uh, some of the really terrific things, uh, amazing things you can do in prep. So, Marcella has a question. Uh, what considerations should you have in regards to volume when using prep? Does it cause performance issues when using large amounts of data? Prep will always sample your data by default. So if you have a table that you're connecting to that has millions of rows of data, prep is only going to pull down a maximum of 555,495 records. I don't know why that's the number, but that's the number. Um, so yeah, it will always sample your data. It, now, if you're connected to a bunch of tables that are really big, there it is going to take some time to uh, pull in that sample. Um, you can tell it to pull in all of the data from those tables if you want to, which will really slow things down. But it does try to do a decent job of, if you're connected to a bunch of really big tables, sampling. And even as you work through the flow, you'll kind of notice that sample gets a little bit smaller to um, account for that, the performance.
Awesome. So uh, does anybody else have any other questions? You can type them in the chat um, or you can chat, uh, type them in the Q&A um, and Jared can see them and he can respond uh, as we go along as well too. So if, uh, you know, if you think of a question you have for data uh, uh, tableau prep, um, you can just put it in the um, chat or, or the Q&A uh, and then we can answer that um, for you. Great. Okay. <clears throat> so thanks so much, Jared. I uh, really appreciate uh, your time there with us. And uh, I think there will probably will be some questions uh, as we go along. Hopefully you can stick around for a little bit. Uh, so now we have uh, Kirk. Kirk Monroe is from Paint with Data. He's a frequent uh, and active member within our community. Tends, he attends almost all our events and always has some great feedback and questions. He's helped me in the past years ago, uh, working as a Tableau uh, Senior Customer Success Manager. And now years later, here he is helping again. He recently published a book, see it there on the screen, Data Modeling with Tableau, which is currently available on Amazon. I think it's uh, gonna be, you can already pre-order it right now, I believe, Kirk. Uh, so uh, welcome, uh, Kirk, from Nova Scotia, Halifax as well, and uh, take it away. Uh, thanks, Roland. And in case people missed in the chat, there's a fun fact. Um, Tableau, at Tableau Conference 17, there was a demo of something called uh, Project Maestro, which ended up becoming Tableau Prep Builder, is, is how that went. Um, I remember demoing it shortly after that. Um, in Toronto, actually downtown, I think in January of 2018 or something. Um, so um, yeah, like Roland mentioned here, if I share my screen, um, and I think we're giving out three e-copies of the book today. So um, I, I just, the book is completely done. So um, it covers everything from, um, you know, what Jared, a lot of the things Jared was talking about, you know, the use cases weren't necessarily that deep. There were some great use cases there, um, but, you know, the book goes through, um, it's got chapters on, I think it's got four chapters on Prep Builder and then what to do in um, uh, in desktop and then considerations and use cases and scenarios where which part of the whole stack you might use. It gets into everything from even how to model data for ask and explain data. So um, today, what I really want to focus on, because couldn't cover everything, obviously, is kind of when to use relationships and when to use um, joins and sometimes how data models can have both. So um, um, in Tableau, um, so until um, the 2020.2 release of Tableau, so like a full two years and a quarter after uh, Prep Builder came out, um, if you were using Tableau desktop, uh, and this is still true with Tableau Prep, to be fair, is you effectively have to, you had to denormalize your data effectively into one big table. So you had to use joins to get there. Um, and sometimes that would cause problems with bigger data sets for sure, because it would lead to data explosion. And, um, and I guess more than that, um, what would happen, the challenge with that, there's some other challenges, like things like, um, you know, how do you handle um, data at different levels of aggregation? So um, we saw there that Jared quickly went through an example of, you know, how, of a cool way that he used aggregation, which was kind of innovative. But sometimes what you find yourself having to do in prep other times is to aggregate data so it gets at the same level before you can join it together. So um, when relationships came out, um, there are, relationships are a way to connect your data at a logical layer as opposed to the physical layer of the actual tables. So that allows you to join data at different levels of aggregation, which is a really important thing. And it also allows you to not worry about your join types because Tableau will dynamically figure out your join types as you go. Let me show you what I mean. Continuing from um, the last kind of cross Canada tug meet, virtual tug meeting where we talked about, or over the group talked about um, the, uh, the the Tableau Biz Com the Canada wide Biz Games. Um, I'm going to use the same data, which is Airbnb data. So it's specifically data you can get from inside Airbnb. Um, and then I downloaded this Toronto data of listings, calendars, and neighborhoods. And then I also downloaded. Um, the walk score for Toronto neighborhoods. Uh, it, I've done this before with a group with Vancouver data. Yesterday I did it um, with a Wisconsin group. I use Chicago data. And in those cases, I also use 
the price of um the price of apartments by neighborhood but try to get that for toronto <laughs> anyway it it doesn't matter anyway in the amount of time we have i'll leave that part out but i still think this will work to, sh to show the case so um i'm going to connect to data here and what we have is um is there's two data there's two pieces of data i want to start with one are toronto listings and this will also show how if you don't know your data well um relationships will, will really help you be able to figure um you know how much like the level of aggregation in the data set i'll show you what i mean so as soon as i connect to a table um uh this is again all the airbnb listings for toronto so if we wanted to know how many airbnb listings there are for toronto um what we do is tableau uh, so tableau dynamically builds a data model for us for people who are new to tableau it will um It'll rename fields dynamically to try to make the metadata more human readable. I think it was pretty good in this file to begin with. But one of the things it does is it will always give you a record count here at the bottom. So what that means is if I click on here, uh, I'm going to see that we have uh, 16,035 uh, unique listings in Toronto, right? So because this is our listings file. So a listings, you know, an apartment host. A, a, literally a listing that you can rent on Airbnb. Um, if we want to see the level of detail of our data, we'll notice that there is an ID field here in the interest of time. And if I click on ID, you'll see down here in the bottom 16,300 and sorry, 16,035 marks. Or I could go like this and do a count, and we're going to end up with 16,035 marks. Um, so, but, th but some other things we can see about our data, like we could go. Um, we can put host ID on here, um, and then we could take the same count and go like this, and we could sort it this way, and we could see that, um, you know, not every, there's more than one host in here. So this host, whoever they are, in, in, in the interest of protecting their identity, I guess their host ID, someone has 129 listings that are on Airbnb. So they've got a lot of capital tied up and they're probably breaking a whole bunch of bylaws as well. But in any case, so I just wanted to show that this is the first piece of data. Now, um, if we if we looked at, let's take a look at um, reviews data. So what reviews data is, is as you would expect, it's the number of, um, uh, it's a, it, it, this is the detailed reviews one. So what it's got is it's got um, every single review that was ever written for a Toronto Airbnb listing. So you'll notice when I pulled that on, um, what Tableau does here is it it um, it creates this noodle, which you can see it's kind of fun to play with. Um, and the noodle signifies that that's not a join; it's just a relationship between those. And right away, what Tableau does, which is which is really powerful, at least for people who knew Tableau pre relationships, is I can query now either one of these tables without writing SQL at all, right? Um, just by asking questions and I can collapse the other one. So if I wanted to see how many reviews there are, um, I could click here and just like I did on the other one. And now we see there's 440, 444,000, almost 446,000 reviews. Um, so that's telling us something right away, right? Um, and then again, you know, similarly, if I took the reviews uh, for, um, uh, you know, if I took the review ID, you get the same number again. But what's interesting, um, if I click the listing ID, um, and what we're going to see here is, and this is where this would start to get messy for anyone who does data work, if we were going to do a join, if I do a count on this, um, on the number of listing IDs, I have 12,640. So if you remember, we had 16,000 and I think 35. So What's the difference between these? So the the difference between these, we could take a look, but the difference between these is going to be um, that not every listing um, has had a review. So a review is a pretty good proxy for booking in this data set. So um, let me let me show you what I mean here. So if we went back to just the Toronto listings table um, and we took uh, our first review, say our last review. It doesn't matter. Say, say our first, let's take our last review. So let's take our last review date and we're going to put it on here. And then um, what I want to do again is I want to take ID. There's a number of ways I can do this. I want to take ID and drop it on here. Um, if you hold down your alt key when you do this or an option key on the Mac, um, 
it'll let you drop it as a measure like that. So hard to demonstrate, but when I pulled that over, you'll notice that popped up, but that's a cool little trick in Tableau for people who don't know it. Um, but what we'll see is, um, sure enough, there's 3,395 that have never had a review, right? So that, if we did the math, I'm pretty sure that should work out to the exact difference between those, which is, um, is how many, uh, how many uh, have never been booked, right? So people either didn't put them up seriously or they were so garbage, no one wanted them. The other thing you can see here is, this is kind of cool to show that um, of all the listings that have ever been on Airbnb for Toronto, over 50% uh, of them, about 50% of them, I guess, have been um, booked this year. Well over 50% of the ones that have ever been booked were booked in 2022. So they're still very active. So this data tells us a lot of cool things. Um, let's see how we can bring this data together and see how it would be different in a join, right? So first off, Tableau got that wrong. So Tableau sometimes going to get the relationship wrong. But what's neat is because every query I did there um, only individually needed either one of those two tables. It didn't even matter that I created the relationships wrong. It was like they were two independent tables, even though they were in the same data model. And what I mean by Tableau got it wrong, it's not Tableau's fault, really. It thought that ID in this must be ID in this. But of course, ID in this is the ID of the listing. And the ID in this is the ID of the review. So what we want is the listing ID. So if we come over now, uh, what we could do, and I'll show you where Tableau, it's almost, I call it magic. It really almost is like that, that um, what we could do now is we could take our listing IDs, right? So this is the actual listing ID. Um, another thing you'll notice here, because so far I haven't created a calculation between these two tables. I don't know how many records are, there's well there's no records of the two tables because they're not joined together so each one of these tables has its own record count um if we did a join it wouldn't be like that which i'll show you in a second if we come like this into a sort what's neat about this is um if we did a join a couple of things would happen depending on which way we do it but if i come all the way down you'll notice that tableau lets me know that there have been zero reviews for these so if if you work with data at all, that's actually kind of a big thing because there aren't zero review. There aren't like there because there's not a review for it. It's really null. But Tableau knows it's smart enough with relationships to go well. That means there's no reviews for that, as opposed to there are null reviews for that. Or in a join, depending on what kind of join we get, which I'll show you in a second. See, we still have sixteen thousand marks here. We wouldn't get this. So this just this just saves, um, you know, hard to get all the concepts across in 30 minutes, but if, if, if you're used to doing joins and SQL statements, um, it's pretty powerful to be able to create a data model that quick, that's intelligent enough um, to do the kind of calculations and return what I needed to return without me having to, to really think about my data model. Um, and this gets data modelers, I love this, every time I talk to someone who is used to writing their own SQL and doing their own joins, a while to believe that Tableau even gets this right. Um, but it, it does almost all the time. So let me show you exactly what I mean. So you can still do joins in Tableau. And the way you do that is um, you open these up. And because joins effectively denormalize whatever you put in it into a single table, um, that's how we're going to create joins and relationships together in just a minute. But for now, if I took the review data and made a join, um, I need a join, something to join on. So that's the same as the relationship ID, the listing ID. But I have to make a call here. And now, depending on what I ask Tableau with a relationship, it's going to dynamically do like we just saw, whether it's a left or right join. And in the last case, it was slick enough even to do something smarter than either a left or right join could do. So let's say I do an inner join which serves its purpose, but an inner join is gonna cause a, a natural filter where I'm not gonna get any data from the Toronto listings unless there's a review. So I'm not gonna get it, right? So if I did this and then I was trying to do an analysis or more so I was creating a data model for somebody else and I wanted them to do an analysis and they wanted to ask the question um, of how many, um, uh, you know, how many, uh, listings have had no reviews, well, you can't anymore. So if I pull ID on now, 
Uh, you'll notice now the other thing is that um, the count, um, the count goes to the bottom and outside the tables because there's only one table, right? And there's this table is like the the join of the two tables. But anyway, if I take this now and go like this, um, you'll see, well, sort of to make it easy. If I go to the bottom of this, there's everyone's got at least one review and you'll notice there's only 12,000 um, 644 marks. What happened there, right, is um, that uh, that because I asked for an inner join, it filtered all the ones that didn't have reviews. So you could be, you could say, Kirk, you can fix that. You could do a left join, right? So if I do a left join, now I'm going to get all the Toronto listings, um, even um, if they, uh, uh, you know, even if they don't have a review. Um, I, if I did a right join, it wouldn't make a difference, by the way, because there's no reviews that don't have listings. So just because it couldn't have a review if it didn't have a listing. But with this thinking, in any case, if I come back over here now, you'll notice I now have 16,000 marks. But at the bottom here, all these reviews have one on them, right? So they're not really reviews, and then some have two. But we know they don't have any. Right, but what it's doing is it's counting rows, and there is a row because I said, "Give me that row, even if it doesn't have a review." So, if someone's not careful, um, they could end up um, with the wrong answer. Right. So, what we could do, we could create a calculated field for sure to say number of reviews, which we would have to do, and we'd have to start thinking about our level of aggregation. This is a very simple example, but aggregations could get complicated, and I could do a count of um, IDs from my reviews table. So that's, this is basically the number of reviews it would have, right? Um, I'm gonna count up that ID as number of reviews. Um, you'll see this calculation falls, well, we'll get to that when we get. Um, if I were to pull this over now as well, now what's interesting is you'll see that these ones at the bottom, some of them have no reviews, but they still have one row, right? And then the ones with one still have one row. Right, because that that makes sense because I got it anyway. Right, so you'd have to be careful with your aggregation on this thing and what answer you're getting. But people have lived with this in Tableau forever until relationships, which just made it so much easier. So um, I'll take questions. I know I'm going kind of fast, but um, I we'll get there for sure in Q and A. What I wanted to show is I want to go back to our relationship here. Um, but I want to show some other cool things you can bring in. So if I can bring in reviews like this again, make sure I get the be like me to miss that. So listing ID, um, something else. If you've never seen um, before in uh, Tableau, is you can also bring in spatial files. So if I wanted to see reviews by neighborhood in Toronto, I could bring in a spatial file, which is this um, Toronto um, geo JSON file like this. Um, if um, only because I looked at the data longer than you guys have it. Connecting neighborhood to neighborhood looks right, but it's actually neighborhood cleansed. Neighborhood's a field that the host can type into Airbnb. And so inside Airbnb, when fix that, so it's neighborhood cleansed. Um, but if we do this, um, what we get is we get this kind of um, slick geometry file like this, which shows us our Toronto neighborhoods. And then if we were to say, put neighborhood on detail, um, we could start doing things like say, um, you know, we could use reviews as a proxy for bookings and go almost all the bookings in Toronto happen down here, um, right? We could actually use our number of reviews to get, it's gonna show us the exact same number because uh, Tableau is smart enough to know the row count in this case. Um, but we could also do things like in this table, there's price. I won't go too far on this, but we could take price and we could put price in here and um, well, uh, then again, what we're gonna wanna do is, cause there's more than one on there. So we're gonna take average price. Um, and there you'll see that South Riverdale, the way they do these neighborhoods anyway, is the most exp expensive, not, not, not surprisingly, uh, the Bridal Pass, Sunnybrook, York Mills area, which I don't know if people have seen come out lately, like the average, uh, you know, they're the most expensive neighborhood. Oh, sorry, the people that have the most net worth in the whole country all live in that area. So it's not surprising they're, it's expensive up there. But, you know, down here, obviously, is for people going to TIFF and hockey games and baseball games and stuff even more expensive. So pretty slick that you can see that that quick. But 
what, what I wanted to show is how you might want to do a join in the same model. Another thing, if you remember like 20 minutes ago or whenever I started, I showed that I also did Toronto walk scores. So I could also come here and bring in my Toronto walk score um, like this. Um, and one thing I want to show you when I bring walk score on is there's a few things here. If I bring walk score in like this, it works perfectly fine, by the way. So I can keep using relationships. And over here now, what I could do is I could say, well, which of these neighborhoods is the most walkable? And I could bring that on, right? Um, but you'll see a challenge I kind of run into of why that, oh, I think it's just because longer conversation. But again, it's gonna, I want an average on this one, should bring it. No, it makes it funny because the reason for that is because I need the neighborhood for, uh, yeah, why is it not giving me? Um, right. So this is where it gets a little like I need, did I put the right neighborhood? I put neighborhood walk score on detail. Take that one off. Oops, reset. Anyway, we, um, uh, cautious at time, but you'll see how um, it, sometimes this will get you into um, a little bit of trouble because you need to make sure that you have the, right neighborhood on detail on this thing. So um, in any case, that should show us our walk score, which we'll get back to. I'm just cautious of time. But one thing I did want to show you is um, you, you might want to do um, what Jared did if you had more time, of course, and clean these up. But if I look at these independently, I'll see that I have 140 neighborhoods for um, in my walk score uh, database, um, you know, in that table, right? And in this Toronto neighborhoods, Geo JSON file, I have 140 neighborhoods. But the interesting thing, if I bring them together onto the same view, you're going to notice that. Am I pulling, did I pull neighborhood group on that? Um, I, you know, sorry, I understand now what I did wrong. My bad. I said I would mess this up on the other one, and I ended up messing it up here. So it's neighborhood cleanse, is what the join is, the relationship here. Uh, and that should now make that fill in. So again, I, that's when you pick neighborhood instead of neighborhood lens. So not surprisingly, the best walk scores are down here. That was just, I picked the wrong linking field there to create the relationship. So you'll see here, 140, I had 140 in here. But if I bring them together, you'll see I have 131 because nine don't match. Um, so there's a number of ways I could find what those nine are. So just by bringing that on, I'm forcing Tableau to say, uh, by bringing the count of one of them on what they are. And what I should really do is go into my data and figure out um, which one of these are and clean them up. But let's let's imagine I couldn't because they didn't line up well. And what I want on purpose is I want to make sure that I filter out all my neighborhoods. Well, two things. One, I want to fill out filter out all my neighborhoods that aren't, aren't going to be on the map because it's just going to be confusing and I'm going to get a bunch of nulls at the bottom of the map. Right, um, because I, when I use neighborhood, I want to use the map. So I don't want any walk scores. Um, I don't want any neighborhoods for my walk scores to come in if they're not on the map. So the easiest way to do that actually is to join. So that's the first reason to do a join. The second reason to do a join is um, it's okay. It's not going to explode my data to bring in to join walk scores to Toronto neighborhoods because they're at the same level of detail. I'm just going to add additional columns, right? These columns to this, if I do my left join to this, um, and it's only 140 rows. So the other thing it'll do is it'll give me a nice grouping in Tableau desktop of things related to neighborhoods at the level of detail of neighborhood. And again, there's 140 neighborhoods, there's 16,000, listings, there's almost half a million reviews, right? So because they're at the same level of detail, it actually is a lot cleaner if I were to if I were to take walk score off for a second. And then I was to go into Toronto reviews and open this up and then take walk score. And in this case on purpose, I want to do a left join on uh, no, sorry, my bad. The problem of rushing. Let me go back. Uh, it wasn't Reviews I wanted to open up, sorry, <laughs> Toronto neighborhoods I want to open up. Um, and I want to take that and um, I also, so I want to bring in uh, walk score on this and I intentionally want to do a left join and I want neighborhood to neighborhood. So in this case, 
I do want a left join because I don't want any of the neighborhoods from this unless they're going to be on my map. So this is going to force that filter at join time, which is what I want. And you'll see my data model is actually a little bit simpler. It doesn't have that table hanging off. Again, sometimes I show up with apartments, like price per apartment, that kind of stuff. It really makes sense to be in a join. And then when we come over to these now, um, what you're going to see, it's going to be a little bit, well, it could, I left it like that. If we went to a new one, um, what we get is we could organize it to be a, like to be a little bit cleaner. And the other thing we could do now is we could do things like um, hide some of these fields um, because did that take? Um, we could do things like hide fields that are duplicates now because um, neighborhood means the same thing in both of those tables. So um, anyway, I wanted to show, yeah, they're all up here. I don't know why it continues to show down here, but you'll notice up here, um, if I built this not so quickly, this table wouldn't show up because we have it combined in this table up here. And what we could do is we could get rid of, before you'll notice I had a whole bunch of different neighborhoods, right? I could come up here now and go, I got neighborhood here, I got neighborhood here. I could, you know, I that one must be on a viz somewhere, right? I could hide this one and then I could just um, rename this to neighborhood. Um, one and the other for you that's okay so i could what's well, the wrong one i meant to take that you out in any case um you hopefully you get the idea i know i went through that kind of quickly but um you know watching online anyway but here's um the point is that the relationships are super powerful but there's still a place for joins old school joins and more importantly um or equally importantly is there's a lot of cases where you might want to do joins and relationships in the same data model um so uh, so that's what I had. So um, with that, I'll turn it back over to Candy and Roland. Well, that was great. Do you have, uh, is there any questions in the chat? I think I see one there. No, I was just uh, someone saying thank you. I think a lot of people are gonna take some time to absorb this one. That was a, a lot to uh, to bring in. I uh, really appreciate uh, your time there. And if you do have questions, uh, please don't hesitate to uh, to bring them uh, towards us, uh, either in the chat or in the Q&A. There is one in the Q&A. I believe there's one in the Q&A. Yes, there's one in the Q&A. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, do you I will stop sharing. Uh, would you be able to see it? Uh, it's just a thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so maybe we want to get uh, what we wait for if there's a couple more questions, maybe we'll wait for that. And then uh, in the meantime, did you want to start the Kahoot, Candy? Yeah, do you want to do the Kahoot now? Yeah. Okay, I will do that. Just a second. I will share the other screen. Just one sec. Uh, so while we're waiting, Kirk, how long did it take you to, uh, to go from... Uh, from the first word to the last word in that book of yours. Oh, to write it? Yeah. Um, it took seven months. Um, it was uh, but 85% of it in the last two months. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's how it well, works. That, that was my bad. Yeah, yeah, that's the way it works. It's like uh, my favorite TED talk is Tim Ferriss's on procrastination. And as he talks about, he was procrastinating doing it. And he says he was three weeks out and he realized he didn't want to do a TED talk. He wanted to have been someone who had done a TED talk in the past. <laughs> so it's kind of one of those feelings. So please join the Kahoot. Uh, yeah, the, the pin is up top. Uh, I can't join because I see the questions. And I, will, <laughs> and I will purposely win it. Uh, but, <laughs> so we'll, uh, I know there's still uh, more participants aboard, so let's, uh, if you can, please, uh, kahoot.it or use the app, and it's 472-1309. We're starting to see some people coming in here, recognize a couple of the names. Wow, someone's name is a city. Awesome. Remember, there's free books for the win three, top three winners here, I think, right? Or yes, three Kirk, e -books, has, to be fair. Kirk has uh, e-codes for his book. 
Oh, that's amazing. Well, I need emails to email, send them to people, but it's just the e-copy. The uh, print ones are expensive, I guess. <laughs> Again, the print ones print are ready. Print ones aren't out on yet. <laughs> well, yeah, they're out on the 30th of December, 30th of this month. So not oh, that long, okay. three weeks, they should be there. So it would just be Amazon or OP? Um, Amazon would be the main place to get it, but they will be able to get it other places. I don't hmm. bookstores, but yeah, but like um, but Amazon and from the publisher's website directly at least. So. Um, okay, so uh, just another minute to let everybody join the Kahoot game. Uh, the game pin will be there um, as we go through, but you know, you do get points for answering quickly. So we'll just give you another uh, few seconds to. Jared, you can join. <laughs> I wrote the question, so uh -huh. I definitely can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to get started. Sounds good. I could do the following steps in Tableau Prep Builder. Wow, you're generous with time. How many, like you get 10, 15 seconds for this one? I think 20 seconds. I think wow. yeah, everybody has 20 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Six answers. Awesome. Yep. That's right. Awesome. Marie's at the top. Okay, two or five. Pulse. To create a relationship in Tableau. My tables need to be at the same level of aggregation. Hmm. And to clarify, this is desktop, is it Kirk? Oh yeah, desk. Well, you can't do relationships in prep builders. So. Oh, that's right. Yes, of course. Right. Of course. Yeah, right. Oh, eight people got it. Yep. Awesome. Marie's still champion. I can pivot rows to columns. Yeah. Awesome. Oh. That's one of the interesting yeah that was a tricky one i guess right well that's one oh, of the things that you can the only top? do in prep build yeah. i can pivot columns to rows in so more than one answer yes more than one answer Multi select. Awesome. Oh, Marie's still champion, but somebody's catching up fast. I can add calculated fields in a workbook connected to a published data source, even if I'm not the owner. True or false? True. Oh, HM is the new champion. Okay, three players just hit an answer. Three, nice. Data management, previously an add-on from Tableau, adds the following capabilities to Tableau Server Cloud. Oh, lots of quick answers there.
Awesome. Yeah, lots wow. of people got that one. Yep. Okay. Jay has a streak with four correct answers. Nice. Deciding which columns to make available for explained datum algorithms are controlled in. It's a tricky one. This is the coolest oh, tableau feature that no one uses. Some quick answers though. Lots of quick answers. Oh, one person got it right. Who was nice. it? Nice. A decider. Mesh. Oh, mesh. Nice. Well done. I can add row level security to my Tableau data model, assuming I'm licensed for data management. Through. All of the above, eight people. Awesome. Well, Emesh is still champion. Five answers in a row. Which of the following can only be done in Tableau Desktop versus Tableau Prep Building? It's interesting the way Kahoot randomly puts these things. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna I was gonna say like we put all of the above at the start, but probably not, eh? Yeah, literally, that's not, um, there's nothing about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. Yeah, all of the above. Yep. You mesh, still champion. Okay. That's Last fun. question. When I publish a data source, people can start using it with Ask Data right away. The hint is the picture. <laughs> You need to create a lens. Ah, tricky one. HM in third place. Marie, congratulations. Oh, and you mesh. Awesome. Uh, so, so we, if the three of you can like message me in the chat with your email addresses, then I can get, uh, I can make sure you get um, your prize. That's awesome. So Jordan, awesome. Now, do we have any questions come in? Right, yes. Um, I do not see any questions. Okay. Um, so I guess don't, uh, don't, uh, <laughs> don't hesitate to uh, reach out uh, on social. If, if you do have questions, uh, everyone is pretty active in social media, whether it be you know, uh, you can reach out to Jared on, um, I think it's VizWhat. And uh, you ha also have your, your YouTube channel where you people can put in comments. And then uh, Kirk as well. Uh, you can find him on, on Twitter. I know that for sure, as well as LinkedIn. I don't know uh, what your hashtags are, but uh, there's also Toronto Tug. Uh, so there's lots of opportunities uh, where people can uh, can reach out and ask questions. And I want to just take this moment here, firstly, before we go to our last slide, is to is to thank Jared and uh, and Kirk for coming in. We really appreciate your time today, um, and uh, you know we learned a lot. I think we all learned a lot, and uh, just amazing uh, amazing presentations. And I love that uh, your your Iron Viz entry. My goodness, like every single one of those dots had something in there. That was phenomenal. Um, I've seen it before, but I didn't. I didn't see that part. That everything was linked, so that is amazing. Uh, so thank you for your time, everyone. Uh, just to continue on the wrap up here, um, if you if you're liking to if you'd like to try uh, speaking at one of our events, or you have some questions, or you'd like to uh, come in uh, and uh, and do a presentation to the community, uh, reach out to myself or Candy, or you can uh, reach us on Twitter. Uh, our next one will be on the 24th of uh, February, 2023. I think I just saw something pop up in the chat, but if we're going to have one in person, I don't know yet. Uh, right now, uh, well, I think we'll just wait in the, we'll wait a couple more weeks and, before we make that decision. 
uh, but you know, we are going to we are planning to have one on the twenty fourth. And then, uh, Candy, is there anything else you wanted to add? No, that's great. Yep. Yeah. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, I hope you found it in, uh, interesting and uh, informative. Uh, but yeah, yeah. So keep uh, uh, keep in touch, and uh, we'll see you in the new year. Hopefully, everybody has a happy holiday. Uh, and it gets a nice break over the uh, over the end of the month, um, and we'll be sending uh, some details soon in the uh, in the new year on the on the upcoming tugs and the 